to make agriculture sexy and cool. I remember our team, Antimani, 
ask that I support the organization before your, your coming. So earlier that morning, I had to scout around and get fresh flowers to put on a table where you're going to sit behind. With the help of our MC, sitting here. After scouting and getting the fresh flowers, your security detail came in and said, what's in your flowers? And then put their hands around it and said, no, we need to take it out. And I was like, oh, I have no idea how I struggle to get these flowers. But more importantly, that day, the account of your journey from Northern Ghana to study communication and the roadmap to politics and thereafter was so inspiring for us who were upcoming communication person. But today, I welcome you to the School of Communication Studies at Wisconsin International University College. And today there are no flowers. <laughs> but there are very keen minds, like mine in 2012, who are looking forward to this interaction. Today marks a very significant moment as we honor um, you as former president in that era, and you will be interacting with our students and our faculty, as well as sharing your perspectives on issues and concerns that are important to the youth for today. This is a strategic one and a demonstration of our commitment to providing our students with the opportunity to engage with persons in the field of politics and communication, especially in this election year. We are looking forward to engaging other political players. Mr. Chairman, our President, the Chairman of our Council, deans, former faculty members, students, and all visitors, visitors, visitors to this program this evening. We welcome all of you. Indeed, it is a great personal honor to have, been, to have the opportunity to introduce His Excellency, Mr. John Brahman Mahama, our former president. I have had the singular privilege to have known His Excellency over the years in a number of important circumstances. When he was explained at Legon, I got to know him first as a member of the political economic study group, then as a brilliant student in communication studies. Now, if our man was in the political education study group, at that time we didn't know he had such ambitions. Uh, now, also, when asked the Vice President of our country, he was launching his book, My First School Guitar, he invited me among a small circle of family, friends and acquaintances with a special pre-publication reading in his home. Again, in 2011 or so, he honored an invitation by the Media Foundation for West Africa, which I headed to participate in an anniversary of the repeal of the criminal library law. One time to His Excellency, if I remember, we met in flight when we were both coming from uh, Freetown, Sierra Leone, and I went to meet him in, in his cabin. And then he introduced me to um, a staff of the hell, and I oh, this is my teacher. He taught me all what I knew. I told him that no, and he's not a politician. <laughs> In all these years, the most remarkable observation I have made of our former president is that the ultimate of national political ascendancy has not in any way diminished, diminished his personal traits as a humble man an affable person who can make you feel at home in his company and who can also make you laugh and relax. As president, he never lost his sense of tolerance to opposing viewpoints and never lost his school against the irritations of unprofessional and insulting journalists. <laughs> he 
me, the first president of Ghana, to have served in all levels of political office, member of parliament, deputy minister for communication, minister for communication, vice president and president of the Republic of Ghana, and His Excellency, if I'm not wrong, he also served in the district assembly. Indeed, His Excellency considers the combination of study of history, communications and social psychology, courses he studied for his bachelor's and postgraduate degrees at the university, as having had a profound impact in shaping his views, thoughts, understanding of the human condition contributed significantly to making him the person he is today. As President, His Excellency made tremendous contributions to development in this country, in all sectors of the economy and in all, in all sectors of national life. And well, once again, we see a contest to leave this country and let us go back and then to remember all this. Uh, former President Mahama is an avid reader and author. Over the course of his career, he has written for several newspapers and authored a number of publications. He has also published his first book, a memoir entitled My First Book, which I referred to earlier. Apart from his love of reading and acquiring knowledge, I understand that President, former President Muhammad is also a farmer. And he learned and got interest in farming from his father, who was once a minister in the Nkrumah's government and who was a prominent rice farmer in the northern region of Ghana. <laughs> Apart from serving as president, he also served as chairperson of ECOWAS. And uh, he has also, he was elected chairperson of the African Union High Level African Trade Committee. Former President Mahama was also the first co-chair of the United Nations Advocacy Group on the Sustainable Development Goals. He is currently the chairperson of the Tana Forum, a high-level forum on security in Africa, which has its headquarters in Ethiopia. And in that end of all, we wish you a lot of success because Africa needs peaceful leaders to help bring peace. Our former president has been conferred with a number of honorary degrees, honorary doctorate degrees from distinguished universities, including a number of universities in Nigeria, the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, and the Lyon Business School in France. President Mahama has been married for 30 years to Mrs. Lyon.
has nothing to do with politics. Uh, it's a tradition that follows wherever you go. In my place in Lagos, I was in Komal Hall. And so when the band said I was coming here, they came here with their Jama group. So it's nothing to do with politics. It's a Banda tradition. Banda means thank you, thank you very much. Let me stand on existing protocol so that I don't risk leaving anybody out. But I think we're all distinguished guests. But I'll signal out my teacher because he introduced me. And um, like he said, he recounted the, how long we've known each other. And yes, it's true, I was in a, a member of a political study cell uh, in the university where young radical students. And um, because as a young person, I was born into a CDP family and I obviously had a left of center orientation. And so these were little political cells that uh, made us study politics and social and so And then um, again, I encountered Prof. In a very interesting way, he was lecturing at the School of Communication Studies and I applied to be a student. And I was in Tamale at the time, I write about it in my book. I tried to get a flight that day to come back to Accra because the interview was the next day. Unfortunately, there were no flights like you have today, just by a ticket and flight. You had to go to the Air Force Station and get some connection with the soldiers to put you on the flight. Unfortunately, my connection didn't work to the flights when they left me. It was the only flight. State transport had also taken off. You couldn't get tickets. They sell tickets to four people in the line. They say the ticket is finished. The rest of the tickets are sold under the table. We've come a long way in Ghana. And so I had to go to the buyer and pay a little something to the policemen to find me a vehicle going to a car. And the only vehicle I got was one road there with maze. And so we all had to go and sit on top of the maze. And uh, it brought us all the way to Kitapur. From Kitapur, I got a bus that brought me to Kumasi. And then a state transport driver that I knew. I explained to him my predicament. There was no seat, but he made me sit on the stairs when you're climbing into the bus. So I sat in the corner and then on the stairs. And I got to Accra. Late, the interviews had started. My name had been called. And Prof was on the interview panel. And so I got there a bit dusty, looking quite to get up, managed to clean my face. And uh, he, he said, Oh, you've been called already. My heart just dropped. It was like, Oh, there goes the opportunity. He said, Okay, you go and sit down. We we'll attend to everybody, one of the things will call you. And so I went and sat outside, very formally. And uh, eventually he called me. He was part of the panel that interviewed me. And um, I must admit, after the interview, he said, You go home, you get a letter from us. And so I knew in my heart that I had been taken. And then, um, of course, when I came to the school, of my teacher in journalism. And he made me learn how to type. Because Prof made a rule that any homework he gave you or any exercise he gave you, he will not accept a handwritten uh, a work. And so you have to go and type. In those days, there were Computers were in their infancy, so you have to go and get an actual typewriter and learn to type, you know. And so I know how to type because uh, Professor Karakari made me type and uh, he's contributed to me. The was one of my favorite subjects, and because of that, afterwards I did my uh, internship in uh, Ghana Broadcasting Corporation and then also taught part time in the uh, Ghana Institute of Journalism and uh, my flair for writing has come from what I learned um, in the School of Communication Studies. I'd like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to get over with the boring parts. Um, I was asked to give a talk on uh, policy on education and how it links to job creation. So I'm going to get rid of the boring part. I think after that, there will be an interactive session. We will be able to flesh out the issues soon. So I'll uh, read this uh, prepared text and then um, after that we can have the opportunity to talk some more. I want to thank you for granting me the opportunity to deliver
by the Maiden Public Lecture in your planned series of lectures organized by the School of Communication Studies of the Wisconsin University for flag bearers standing in the 2024 general elections. I'm particularly grateful to the management of Wisconsin International University College and the Acting Dean School of Communication Studies of the college for offering me the platform to share perspectives of my vision on the youth within the context of education and job creation. This program is being held at a time of great national distress and economic crisis. Our economy is in tatters and on the verge of collapse. It has been mismanaged into unprecedented crisis which have afflicted all of us with unbearable suffering and pain. The features of our economy in the last few years under this administration has been an astronomical public debt which we are able to pay, humiliating debt defaults, embarrassing credit rating downgrades, hyperinflation, a collapsed currency, widening budget deficits, and very painful cost of living crisis. Over 1.3 million of our compatriots, including pensioners, have had to endure extremely painful appropriation of their interest and principal payments under the so-called domestic debt exchange. This is a crisis which would have been entirely avoided if the caution of the opposition and civil society had been needed in a timely manner. The extremely harsh effect of the economic mismanagement can be seen all around as it has ravaged almost every sector of our country and the education sector is one of the hardest hit. At the last reckoning, there were over 5,400 school total number of children in basic schools. Over 1.2 million children of school going age between 4 and 17 years are not in school. Out of this number, almost 1 million of them, to be precise, 942 1,427 children are reported to have never attended school, and this is in the Population and Housing Census of 2021. So these are facts I'm reading out to you. For four straight years, textbooks have not been supplied to schools, and one can only wonder how teachers and students alike are coping. And this is after a change in curriculum textbooks have not been made available. For six consecutive terms, capitation grants have not been released to schools. It is important to stress that it is through these capitation grants that basic inputs at the primary level, like uh, uh, writing boards, etc., are provided. Attendance registers, among others, it is through these capitation grants that they are procured for the running of the schools. We are all familiar with the numerous demonstrations and strike actions, some of which are currently ongoing and backed on by school feeding caterers over non-payment of monies due to them. In the last few months, suppliers of food for the Buffer Stock Company Limited, which in turn supplies senior high schools with food, have staged a certain strike at the premises of the company to demand millions of Ghana CDs that is owed to them. And recently, there was a teacher who was, and the headmaster was explaining that they sell what is available. And so sometimes they have only rice. So rice water in the morning, rice in the afternoon, and mutu in the evening. And then when they have only maize, cocoa in the morning, uh, uh, bantu in the afternoon, tozafi in the evening. In addition to these, the erratic academic calendar at the senior high school level, inadequate infrastructure, leading to overcrowding, insanitary conditions, intimidation and victimization of school heads and teachers and other stakeholders and misguided policy making are some of the problems that exist in our educational sector today. At the tertiary level, we are also too aware of the severe accommodation shortages on campus and the astronomical rents and fees that students have to pay to secure accommodation as close to the institutions as possible. 
This is due to an investment in facilities on the various campuses which GET Fund was designed to address. Non-payment of funds agreed to GET Fund and the collateralization of the fund by this government have hampered the investment that should otherwise have been made to address the problems I have just outlined. We believe that the ad hoc haphazard political motivated policy making and implementation and the short sighted tinkering that have created these problems must give way to substantive thinking and offering that curate appropriate and visionary solutions to our educational challenges. My vision for the youth in respect of our education is to focus on their holistic development by balancing their intellect, which is their head, their character, which is their heart, and their skills, which is their hands. So it's heart, head, heart, and hands. The three H's. To this end, I will facilitate an educational system that does, that does not only expand access to education, it's not only about access, so we first integrate a system that does not only expand access to education, but more importantly, that it indexes access expansion to quality and equity. And therefore, access, quality, and equity are the three key pillars that will drive our vision in education. In pursuit of this vision, my administration will promote and prioritize investment in education, particularly at the education, at the basic education level. I commit myself to strengthening basic level education because if the preschool and primary level of education that provide foundational learning opportunities are weak, performance at the secondary level will continue to be a challenge. The next NDC government will invest heavily in the construction and renovation of schools with particular focus on underserved and rural areas. We will continue our program to remove schools and the trees and provide furniture for children at the basic level. With regards to the free, the e -books, in our effort to expand access to education, we will revisit the initiative of Community Day Senior High Schools, which were popularly called the e -block. These schools have been abandoned without any justifiable reason by the current administration. We're going to build more e -blocks, community day schools, in high urban population areas, and I'm talking about this, what I've said is, in some of the high urban population areas where land is difficult to find, we're going to take existing secondary schools because we have extra land, and we'll put a second secondary school on the same land so that we can expand the number of children who have access to secondary education. With the e blocks or the community based schools, that we have built in rural areas that have a wide catchment area. We will provide dormitory blocks so that children who come from outside the community where the school is will have a place to stay while they are there. With the much publicized pro problem militating against the free and uh, successful implementation of the free SHS program, we intend to tackle them head on. And as I've said earlier, within 100 days of my being sworn into office, the next NDC government will hold a stakeholder consultative engagement to discuss the challenges facing our educational sector with special focus on improving implementation of the free SHS policy. So this stakeholder engagement will discuss basic, secondary, and tertiary, but with emphasis on improving the implementation of free uh, secondary education. 
Through this stakeholder dialogue, we will collectively devise strategies and solutions to further pause the decline and improve the free SHS program. We are committed to abolishing the double track system as soon as possible. Mr. Chairman, between 2012 and 2016, my administration paid particular attention to technical and vocational education. When we regain power in 2024, we will revisit the initiatives that we commenced and will review the current trends and make TVET education more engaging and industry driven. Enhancing partnerships between TVET institutions and industries across various sectors will be a priority involvement of our industries in shaping TVET training curricula that align with their needs, uh, with, with the needs of the job market. And this is what we're going to emphasize so that students should be more equipped with entrepreneurial and practical skills that fit the job market. With regards to STEM education, we're going to streamline STEM education, mainstream STEM education into our educational system. We don't believe in standalone STEM secondary schools like this administration is building. We believe that to get a holistic training, all-round training, even if you are studying the humanities, you need some science education and some mathematics and technical education. And so rather than build standalone STEM secondary schools, we're going to rehabilitate all the old science resource centers and bring them into STEM centers. So that all the secondary schools can have access to STEM learning instead of a few privileged uh, secondary schools. In all the e-blocks that we built, the community-based schools, we put four laboratories a laboratory for physics, for chemistry, biology, and general science. Those laboratories are going to be the STEM centers for the community-based schools. We're going to develop those laboratories in all the community-based schools as their STEM centers. With all the other secondary schools, the science resource centers will be available for them to use as their STEM centers. An NTC leadership will also enhance the quality and availability of online mode of distance learning as a way of diversifying the delivery of tertiary education in the country. These flexible learning options will grant more students access to tertiary education while fulfilling their other employment commitments. <laughs> 